Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru. Wa ni'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Amma ba'du fa inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah. Wa khair al-hadi hadi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharra al-amuri muhdathatuha. Wa kulla muhdathatin bid'ah. Wa kulla bid'atin dalala. Wa kulla dalalatin fi nnar. Amma ba'd. Then I welcome you my sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and preserve you and protect you. Today, Saturday the 21st. 21st of uh, Jamaad al-Ula in the year 1443, which is the 25th of December, a Saturday in the year 2021. And we continue with the explanation of the hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a specific focus that I will give towards our sisters and towards the affairs of women and families and so on. And that is the explanation of Al-Adab Al-Mufrad of Imam Al-Bukhari, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And he is, of course, Al-Imam Abu Abdullah, Muhammad bin Ismail Al-Bukhari, who died in the year 256 after the Hijra, with benefits and uh, notes from the noble, shah, and the noble scholar, the Sheikh, the Allama, Zayd bin Muhammad bin Hadi Al-Madkhali, Rahimahullah from the, great, from the great scholars of this era who died several years ago. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The hadith that we reached is hadith number 260. And the chapter is the chapter Bab At-Tihab Bainan Nas. So this is At-Tihab or At-Tahab rather, At-Tahab Bainan Nas, which is love between the people. So this is a chapter regarding the love and affection between the believers. So Imam al-Bukhari brings his chain of narration, which is, he said, that Ismail bin Abi Uwais narrated to us, and he said that my brother narrated to me from Suleiman bin Bilal, from Ibrahim ibn Abi Usaid, from his grandfather from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu from Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ by the one in whose hand is my soul لَا تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُسْلِمُوا you will not enter into paradise until you submit وَلَا تُسْلِمُوا حَتَّى تَحَابُوا and you will not truly have submitted until you love one another. وَأَفْشُ salam تَحَابُّ So therefore, spread the salutation of salam and you shall love one another. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْبُغْضَ And beware of hatred and hating. فَإِنَّهَا for indeed hatred shaves away. La aqulu lakum, and I do not say to you, tahliqu shar, and I do not say to you that it is the shaving of the hair. Walakin tahliqu din, rather it is the shaving away of the religion. And the hadith, it is hasan li ghayrihi, so it is acceptable, it is authentic. And it is ascribed to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are numerous benefits in this hadith, my sisters. And you can, just by what you have heard of this narration, you can see the tremendous advice of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he has enjoined upon the believers to love one another. He has enjoined upon the believers to submit to Allah. He has warned them that they, are not, that they will not enter into Jannah up until they submit. And they will not submit truly up until they love one another. How do you love one another? 
from the means that will establish the love between the believers is the spreading of the salam. That you say, Assalamu alaykum to your fellow Muslim, brother or sister, Assalamu alayki, Assalamu alaykum, Assalamu alayka. That you spread the salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And Allah's mercy be upon you and Allah's blessings. So this hadith is an evidence of the obligation of loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to take the means to achieve that love and to be distant from that which opposes love and brotherhood and sisterhood between the believers. And there is no doubt that love between the Muslims between the Muslimin and the Muslimat, meaning between Muslims, males and females, Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters, is an affair that is obligated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is from the beautiful and tremendous manners and etiquettes of Islam. And that is to love a Muslim that a Muslim man, that a Muslim male that he loves his brother Muslim and that he loves the believing person, that he loves other believers. And this is the same for men and for women, that you love your sister for the sake of Allah, that you love your brother for the sake of Allah. And this is a mahabba or this is a mahabba that is mahabba shari'a. It is a religious and lawful and legal love for the sake of Allah and for Him alone. And it is upon this that a person will be rewarded upon this basis. A person shall be rewarded and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them paradise because of the hadith that we have mentioned that you will not enter into Jannah up until you love one another up until you submit and you will not submit up until you love one another so it is an obligation my sisters to take those means that will bring about love that you love a person for no other reason except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the foundation of the relationship between the believers. That they love for Allah, they hate for Allah, they give for Allah, they take for Allah. And if they do that, that they have indeed perfected Iman. It is easy to say that we love for Allah and that we hate for Allah and that we give for Allah and we take for Allah. Because the reward for that is immense. Perfection of Iman. And the one who has perfected Iman enters into Jannah. Just as the one who submits to Allah enters into Jannah. But in your everyday life, if you count or if you enumerate whether you actually do love for Allah, whether you actually do hate for Allah, whether actually you do give for Allah and take for Allah, then you'll find that with many of us that there is a huge difference between that which we claim and that which we do. Because if you love someone for Allah, you do not backbite them or speak ill of them. And you do not harbor hatred for them. So you say, yes, I love for Allah. And then you display disdain and dislike for a believer, for your believing sister, for your Salafi sister, for your Sunni sister. If it was love for Allah and hate for Allah, then you would withhold speaking against them and speaking ill of them. So it is obligatory that we love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So since this affair is so important and great in the life of the Muslims in this world, in the barzakh and in the hereafter because this affair is mentioned in the hadith because this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause a person to enter into Jannah. So it doesn't only affect the relationship between the believers in this world in terms of their mutual strength and their affinity and they're helping each other, aiding each other, rushing to help another believer when they're in need and when they need you. Whether it be a janaza, whether it be a death, whether it be a sickness, whether that they are poor, whether they are destitute, 
Maybe they need a loan. Maybe they need to be helped on their journey to get to their destination. That it is, that is the benefits of this world. Then in the hereafter, that person is entered into Jannah. Why? Because of this hadith and hadith are similar to this. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ guided the believers to the means that will bring about love between the Muslimin and the Muslimat, between the Muslim men, between each other and the Muslim sisters, between each other. And of course, this does not mean that this is just, you know, women love women and men just love men. No. It transgresses the, or, 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 or it passes over those boundaries and it transgresses those boundaries. Meaning that you love for Allah and that you hate for Allah and that you give for Allah and you take for Allah. This is between men and women as well. That truly, as believers, in general, umuman, not that you would go to a brother and say to him, I love you for the sake of Allah. No, because that is not, you know, from the affairs that is known from the believing women that they say, you know, that they meet a man and they say, I love you for the sake of Allah. No, rather the, the women are amongst the women and men are amongst the men. But that does not mean that in your hearts that you don't love the believing men or that the believing, women don't, believing men don't love the believing women. They do. Because that love is a love, a muhabba, you know, that is shari'ah, built upon iman and built upon submission. So therefore, that the believers, that they have this muhabba. And that's why the Prophet wasallam said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, you will not enter into Jannah up until you submit. Meaning, up until you judge by Islam in all of your affairs. In all of your dealings. In all of your relationships. With your husband, with your children, with your parents, with your neighbors, with your relatives, with the rest of the Muslims. With Ahlul Bid'ah, with Ahlul Sunnah. With Ahlul Kabair, with the major sinners with the people who aren't as practicing as they should or they are not practicing as they should be practicing their religion that all of these relationships are judged are, are, are tempered or that they are based upon your judgment and your judgments returning back to Islam to the kitab and the sunnah so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said wala taslimu hatta tahabu that you will not have submitted or you have not truly submitted up until you love one another. So a person's Islam is not perfected up until he loves for Allah and he hates for Allah. He has allegiance for Allah and he has enmity for Allah for his sake. And indeed, from those means that will bring about love between the believers and bring their hearts together is to spread the salam, to say, As-salamu alaykum. For this reason, the Prophet wasallam said, spread the salam and you will love one another. Meaning that you extend salam to others. And this is from the adab al-Islam, or this, this is from the manners of Islam and the etiquette of Islam. That the young person gives salam to the older person. The one who is walking past gives salam to those who are stationary or sitting. The one who is riding gives salam to those who are walking. Those who are fewer in number give salam to those who are many in number. So the one person that passes a group, it is the one person that initiates the salam. So all this is about initiating the salam. So the one who enters gives salam to those who are present, who are already seated. The young person 
initiates the salam to the older person. The one who is passing by gives salam to those who are seated and so on. So the few give salam to the many. This is from the adab of al-Islam that we should cultivate in ourselves and in our children. And that is that we say and we say with a clear voice and we say openly so that the believers can hear when you, when you address them. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. So when a person says this, he earns the love of the one that he has given salam to. And he earns the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the salam is given in complete form, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. So these three are mentioned, all three. As-salamu alaykum, peace be upon you, wa rahmatullahi, and the mercy of Allah, wa barakatuh, and his, and his blessings. By saying these three words, he has gathered for himself 30 hasanat, or 30 rewards. Why? Because for each of those words that he has said, there is 10 for him. So in that, barakallahu feekum, there is blessings for you. There is reward for you. And there is, you know, something that enters into your heart of love for one another. And this salam and the giving of salam is from the outward signs of, a, of, of the religion. It is from the outward signs of the Muslims, male and female. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he guided the believers to extend the salam. Is it permissible to give salam, a man to give salam to a woman? Yes. A woman to give salam to a man? Yes. It is permissible. As long as there is not in that any frivolity or any bad intent. There's no harm in that. Barakallahu feekum. So even if it is like, for example, you walk into a shop, a sister walks into a shop and there's a Muslim male who's, who's, who's there behind the counter, for example. So you purchase what you purchase and you put it on the counter. You can see clearly he's a Muslim. Is he allowed to give salam? She's a woman and he's a man. Yes, he is. As-salamu alaykum. Oh, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. It is allowed. Barakallahu feekum. And there is no evil intent in that. And there is no suspicion upon either of them in that regard. Barakallahu feekum. Because this is something, a woman, meaning in generality, that puts that mahabba shari'ah. Remember that this is the love that is legal and lawful between the believers. That keeps the brotherhood of the Muslims together. So that they help each other, they aid each other, they support each other when they are in need. This is something that is within it khair, my sisters. Between yourselves especially. More so. At a conference or at a gathering or at a dars. Or when you meet each other or that you pass each other in the street. That you give salam to each other. And this is more worthy between Ahlul Sunnah. Because Ahlul Sunnah that they love each other for the sake of Allah. And because they are upon the Sunnah. The Amatun Nas, then of course we give them salam. And when they give us salam, we rad the salam, we return the salam. But if we do not give salam amongst ourselves in our households, in our families, amongst the sisters, in the rows, in classes, and so on, then that is a huge negligence on our behalf. That is a terrible affair. That we don't give salam to each other. We don't give salam. The husband doesn't give salam to his wife. Or the wife doesn't give salam to her husband. Or that it is whispered and it can't be heard. Or it is a mumble. As if it is embarrassing to give salam. Sometimes when Muslims are amongst kuffar. That they won't give each other salam. Because they're shy in front of the kuffar. What is there to be shy about? 
with respect to this excellent and noble and tremendous religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us as a bounty from him. Even if you're amongst the kuffar, assalamu alaykum ukhti. Peace be upon you, my sister. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let the kuffar hear. And if the kafir hears it, maybe one day the kafir will say to you, Assalamu alaikum. And it is permissible to return the salam to the unbeliever who initiates the salam. So if they say, Assalamu alaikum to you, you can say, Wa alaikum as salam, as Shaykh al Albaniya said, with the full sentence. Unless there is something in their speech that is hidden from you, that it is unclear to you that they mumble something, then you can just say, Wa alaik, and upon you too, because you don't know. Maybe, as the Prophet, as the as the Jews did to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, assalamu alaikum. That may may you be poisoned. So then, when Aisha radiallahu anha became angry and she invoked the curse of Allah upon them, she said, "Oh, he said, oh Aisha, just say to them wa alaikum. That is sufficient. So if they intended evil, then back upon them, and if they, if they intended good, then back upon them. Barakallahu fiikum." Then Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he when he mentioned the affair of extending the salam due to that which due to the, that which there is in it of reward and affection then he warned against Baghda or having hatred due to what is within hatred of sin and the cause of separation and division between the hearts of the believers. And the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu was salam, that he struck a similitude after that. So he began by saying, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْبُغْضَى and, and beware of hatred, meaning be warned from it. Be warned from hating each other without any religious reason, without any sabab that is shar'i. For no reason that you, without any religious reason that you harbor hatred and jealousy and rancor and dislike towards your believing sister or towards the believers in general, male and female, beware of that. Because the origin of the affair between the Muslims is love and affection. Just as Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادِّهِمْ وَتَرَاحُمِهِمْ وَتَعَاطُفِهِمْ كَمَثَلِ الْجَسَدِ الْوَاحِدِ إِذَا اشْتَكَى مِنْهُ عُدْوٌ تَدَعَى لَهُ سَائِرُ الْجَسَدِ بِالسَّهَرِ وَالْهُمَّا He said alayhi salatu wa sallam in this hadith reported by Imam Muslim in his sahih that the similitude of the believers in their love for one another and in their mercy for one another and in their affection for one another is like one body. When one part of the body complains of pain, then the rest of the body joins it in restlessness and fever. This is how the believers should be. This is what in fact we have been commanded to be like that. That we feel the pain of our sister, the pain of our brother. As if they are actually your blood relatives because the believers are like one body. So imagine physically that you are one body. So when your hand hurts, you've cut your hand or you've bruised your hand or you've burnt your hand. The rest of your body doesn't feel the pain. Can you go to sleep? Can you rest? No, because now... One part of your body is suffering. So the rest of the body joins you in restlessness and fever and trying to solve the problem of this pain. Likewise are the believers, your sisters, your brothers, your family members. This is how it should be between the Muslims and more so between Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a, the Salafiyun. So hatred is the opposite of love. And hatred between the believers is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So it is not permissible for a Muslim to hate his brother Muslim or for a Muslim sister to hate another Muslim male or female without a lawful legislated reason. And indeed the open sinner from the Muslims, then yes, he's hated. But there's a reason why he's hated. Because he is defying Allah. He's disobeying Allah. So a sinner is hated. Why is he hated? Because of the fact that he is disobedient to Allah. That's why we, that's how, you know, we understand the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the one who loves for Allah, hates for Allah, gives for Allah, takes for Allah, has indeed perfected iman. So loving for Allah and hating for Allah. Why would you hate for Allah? You'd only hate a person who is disobedient and distant from Allah and he doesn't care about his sins. So the, so the sinner from amongst the Muslims, yes, then there is, he is hated. And likewise, the people of Bid'ah from amongst the Muslims, they are Muslims, but we hate them. Why do we hate them? We hate them for Allah's sake because they are opposing the sunnah. They are defying the kitab of Allah, the book of Allah and the sunnah of Allah's messenger. They are opposing the way of the companions and they persist upon that way. They add to the religion that which is not from the religion, so they are hated. But the hatred here is for Allah. It is not for any dunya sense. It's not because they have more wealth than you or less wealth than you or they are from a different, you know, from a different tribe to you or a different skin color to you. These are not the reasons why we hate people. We don't hate people because they're rich or because they're poor or because they are a different color or because they're tall or because they're short or because they're fat or because they're thin. We don't hate people based upon these lines. We don't hate them because they come from a certain country. We don't hate them because they're sick or because they're healthy. Love and hatred is based upon the deen of Allah, the religion of Allah, the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, the people of Bid'ah, we hate them for Allah's sake. Likewise, the Ashab al-Kaba'ir, those who commit major sins openly, brazenly, shamelessly fornicating homosexuality pornography drinkers drunkards those who consume alcohol from amongst the Muslims those who fornicate from amongst the Muslims those who deal in riba and they sell mortgages from amongst the Muslims those who take riba from amongst the Muslims and they don't care Those sisters or those brothers who disobey Allah and they commit major sins day in and day out and they do so shamelessly. Displaying themselves on social media, dancing or drinking or smoking or inviting others to fornication or that which leads to fornication or music or spreading sins amongst the believers. Then we hate them. Even if they are Muslim. But that hatred is not for any dunya reason. Meaning that we don't hate them. Because they have done anything to me personally. But we hate them because they are disobedient to Allah. And they are committing major sins. And they are brazen. And they are shameless. And they have no shame in what they do. That now is a shari excuse to hate them. Just like there is a shari excuse to hate the people of Bid'ah. Why? Because this is now connected to Allah and connected to that which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu has commanded or prohibited. That love and hate is permissible. So the closer a person is to the obedience of Allah, the more that he is loved or she is loved. The further they are away from the obedience to Allah, the more that they are disliked and despised. However, when we hate the Muslims because of their kabair and because of their disobedience to Allah and because of their shameless and brazen and open commission of sins, our hatred of them is not like the hatred that we have for the kuffar. It is a different hatred. They are Muslims. So it is not a hatred 
that takes that that would that would that we would have for those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in totality like the pagans and the kuffar because the hatred of them is a different level of hatred because they are eternally in the hellfire but as for the believer the muslim who is weak in iman and they commit all then yes we hate them and yes we would boycott them and yes we would stay away from them and yes we would not keep company with them but we would advise them just like you would advise an unbeliever and we'd remind them of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time it is permissible to warn others from them if their sin is public and open or that their bid'ah is public and open then yes they are to be warned against and it is permissible as Sheikh Zaid rahimahullah he said here that it is permissible likewise to boycott the sinful Muslim that it is permissible for a Muslim to boycott his brother for Allah's sake that you abandon him and you boycott him if he is persistent upon his sins and he won't give up the sins and disobedience to Allah and this boycotting is for the purpose that he may return to the truth and to the vastness of the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed And this is this boycotting of him and a, is a punishment for him and it is a cause of earning the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when they recognize that pious, good, righteous, practicing people don't want anything to do with me, then that will make them ponder and reflect. And they may even ask, why don't you, why, you know, why don't you Mix with me. Why don't you take my companionship? Say, because you're a, you're a person who disobeys Allah. And I don't want to be with a person who disobeys Allah because I may begin to disobey Allah because of you. That you may affect me. So I don't want to mix with you up until you repent and that you are no longer disobedient. It doesn't mean that you have to be coarse or rude. So you can advise your Muslim sister who doesn't wear the hijab, for example. You advise her politely that you need to cover. Cover your head. Cover your shoulders. Cover your body. Cover yourself. This is the deen of Allah. It is not a game. Cover yourself, my sister, and Allah will reward you. Allah will reward me for covering my body. Yes, Allah will reward you for putting that cloth on your body. Allah will reward you. So cover yourself. And show modesty. Don't display yourself in public. Don't put selfies of your face with lipstick and makeup as a profile picture for yourself on Twitter or WhatsApp or wherever else that you are. Stop that. A woman is supposed to conceal her beauty, lower her gaze, increase in her modesty, seek nearness to Allah through modesty. And shyness. For indeed shyness is from the branches of Iman. And Allah has commanded you to have this level of shyness and modesty, my sister. But if she's a woman who's going to display herself on social media, herself and her body and her makeup with a new picture every other day or every other week, and then she's inviting people to look like her and behave like her. And she wears tight garments and she reveals her parts of her body. Is it permissible to stop keeping company with such people? Yes. Rather, it is something that is matloob, something that is desirable. That you keep away from evildoers. And she may ask you, my sister, why, why don't you uh, mix with me? Say, because... I don't want to associate with a person who is constantly disobeying Allah because what afflicts you might afflict me. If Allah punishes you and I'm in your company because I'm enjoying your company and I'm not forbidding evil from you, then I might be afflicted with what you're afflicted with of punishment. I don't want to be with people like this because the punishment might encompass me as it encompasses you. I will keep company with people who are obedient to Allah, my sister. If you want to rectify yourself, I'll help you. What do you want to know? 
I find it hard. Read the book of Allah. Make zikr of Allah. I find it hard because my friends are bad and, you know, they behave like this, so I behave. Then stay away from those friends. Find a new company of friends that will bring you closer to Allah. You don't want to end up Yawmul Qiyamah biting your hands because you regret keeping company with the righteous. Mix with the good sisters. Come to the dars. Stop sitting in front of the TV and watching this garbage day in and day out. Stop listening to music. Stop freely mixing with men. Get married. Build a home. Find a righteous man. A man who will provide for you, look after you. You'll be proud of him and he'll be proud of you. Tell them things that will cause them to reflect. So therefore it is allowed to boycott them and to keep distant from them. However, hatred for one another, for the believers in general, then it is not allowed. Just as Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْبُغْدَى And beware of hating. Meaning, stay away from hating one another. O oh, Muslims, brothers and sisters, stay away from hating one another when there is no reason to hate them. No reason to hate them. Hatred that is driven by personal goals and desires, keep away from it. Rather, it is obligatory to overlook shortcomings in a person's worldly affairs. Love one another and overlook and pardon and forgive due to, the, due to what that leads to from affection and nearness and unity and sisterhood. That you bring your hearts together, that you aid each other, that you support each other. Give gifts to each other. Say nice words to each other. Sit close to each other. When you come to a dar, sit close to each other. And sit with people that you know and sit with people that you don't know. Give salam to whom you know and give salam to those whom you don't know. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised. Send a gift. Send some food. Spread. This mahabba shari'iyya, this lawful and legal and legislated love. And that will unite our ranks, the ranks of Ahlu Sunnah. And when the rest of the Muslims, meaning those Muslims who are deceived by the dunya, deceived by bid'ah, when they see this excellent conduct and these manners amongst the ranks of the Salafiyun, that will make them more attracted and more you know, more desiring of entering into this blessed da'wah. In the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and beware of hatred for indeed there is in it a shaving and I do not say to you it is the shaving of the hair but rather it is shaving away of the religion. So in this is a clarification of the severe danger of hating one another. When a Muslim brother hates another Muslim, when a Muslim hates his Muslim brother, or a Muslim sister hates her Muslim sister, for no reason, no religious reason whatsoever, or that she hates another Muslim brother, meaning that it is not just within your own sex, but even the opposite sex. And by doing so, by, by, by having that type of hatred, there is a great deficiency there is a great deficiency in reward that you're missing out upon and a deficiency in your religion. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ, that he struck the similitude with shaving. And if the affair is like that, that it will shave away your religion, it will carve at your religion, making your religion deficient and deficient and deficient because of this hatred that you harbor towards others this jealousy sometimes that the believers have for one another and we seek refuge with Allah from being jealous and envious of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given more to we seek refuge from that so Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
has advised us how to behave with each other with love and respect. So it is obligatory to follow that which the Prophet ﷺ has guided towards of love for Allah and for his sake and warning from hatred and to beware of hatred that occurs between Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters due to personal issues of no value, no worth that is ignited by the accursed and rejected and outcast shaitan and his followers. It is Iblis, shaitan and his army that want us to hate each other. All of them are in lust, so they want you to be lust and be in lust just, like, just as they are in lust. So pardon my sisters, overlook each other, leave alone trivialities and leave alone suspecting the people and looking into the intentions and the niyat of your sisters. If they are Salafi and upon the Sunnah, then love them for the sake of Allah. If they have bad character, overlook them. And it is not an excuse, my sisters, and actually that is the next hadith. I won't get a chance to begin it today, but the next hadith actually and its explanation is, is, is beautiful, Allah Mubarak. But inshallah, next week we'll cover that. But the affair of having this good character and being grateful to the bount, for the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us and being kind to others and overlooking, acting as if it didn't occur. That's the best solution in many cases. Someone says something to you and it's a bit off key, out of turn. Then how do you behave? Pretend as if it didn't happen. Barakallahu feekum. Not everything needs an answer. Not everything needs a response. Not everything needs to be challenged. And that's what makes a good husband, to be honest with you. Because he has to ignore. Because if he was to pick out every single mistake, there'll be no end. And likewise, the wife, when she looks at her husband, to overlook, pretend it didn't occur. Don't worry yourself over it. Because there is huge amounts of khair in pardoning and overlooking and pretending as if it didn't occur so as to soften the hearts. To bring the hearts together within families, within relatives, within relationships, within the masjid, within your community. This is how the believers are. This is the, you know, this is the true siyasa shari'a. You know, this, the way of diplomacy that the Sharia guides to, to maintain unity, to, main, to maintain order, to remove disorder, to remove, you know, this dysfunctionality that is prevalent in many societies. Because we are looking at the religious affairs, the affairs of, ibad, of ibadah and ta'a, obedience to Allah, worship of Allah. If it encroaches upon that, then yes, we have a reason to hate. We have a reason to boycott. We have a reason to distance. We have a really reason to be more formal as previously we may have been more informal and social. So bear that in mind, Barakallahu Feekum, and I hope our sisters when they attend these durus that they are taking notes, inshallah, so that you can refer to those notes and, and take them as a reminder. And teach them likewise to your relatives and to your neighbors and to your colleagues and so on. And upon that, inshallah, we'll finish for today. Jazakumullahu khaira. If I can get through maybe one or two questions, inshallah, in the next five minutes. Scenario. Two Salafi brothers. Both have children of marrying age. One brother and his family visit the other family. Okay. When visiting the daughter of each family, although wearing hijab, freely walk in and out of the communal rooms occupied by their male cousins. As long as female members of the family are present, no conversation is held other than giving salam to each other. Is this situation considered to be within keeping the ties of kinship or does it fall into free mixing? The general rule is that there is an area in the house for women. And when women visit, and there's an area of the house for men, and when men visit. And there should not be free mixing between non-mahrams. 
However, is it allowed for a reason for a woman who is fully covered with the shari hijab, jilbab and so on to enter upon men for a need? Like for example, she's bringing in food to serve the men. So she is covered in, you know, she's wearing a hijab and she's covered completely. She's no makeup or anything that opposes the, the covering of the Muslim woman, then yes, it is allowed for her to come in, say, Assalamu alaikum, put the tea, biscuits, whatever, food on the floor, and then she leaves. There's no harm in that, Barakallahu feekum. As for now, you have one room, and we know the houses in the United Kingdom. It's not like, you know, the size of this musalla, as you, you can find actually in many Muslim countries, that the rooms are huge. Right? So, in fact, you know, in one corner the men can sit and the women are in a completely different corner and, you know, it's, you know, maybe there's a screen between them. But in these lands, the rooms are small. So, you know, the men and the, the boys and the girls of young age, teenage, teenagers, even though she's covered, they're walking in and out, in and out, in and out. Then that is not praiseworthy, barakallahu feekum, because that is from the bad habits that people get used to. So he opens a door that is difficult difficult to close for later times but as I mentioned if there's a need they can come in you know they need to come in to uh, pick up a book or to ask a question and then they leave no problem as long as they're covered but as for sitting together coming in and out together and so on no I, I do not advise with that because that will open up a door because it is not the same you know in these countries where the rooms are small you come in you know they literally the person the, the man could be a meter away from you so you come in and they come out and go, what's the purpose? Like, I mean, the, I mean, you look at the question. The question says, they freely walk in and out of communal rooms. Why? Occupied by their male cousins. No conversation is held other than salam. If there's no conversation held, then why are they walking freely in and out of communal rooms? When you say communal rooms, you basically what you're saying is that there's no segregation in the house. Every room is communal. So there's a room in which men are sitting and women, women can walk in and out, in and out, but they don't talk and they don't say anything and they don't do anything. So, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to envision what's going on here. So there's a room, you know, a living room in an average house in Birmingham. So the doors open. There are men sitting in that room. So an 18-year-old girl in hijab walks in. Says, Salaam Alaikum walks out five minutes later two of them walk in then they walk out what's the purpose what purpose be, is being served here you know what they want exercise what do they want it doesn't make any sense if there's a need then yes I've already said that if there's a need like they say you know I just go and put the tea into the living room where the men are so she you know opens the door she says salam alaikum she's wearing the hijab she puts the tea down and she walks out Okay, there's a reason. But here it says, they walk freely in and out of communal rooms occupied by their male cousins. You're opening up a door. Because these cousins won't talk to each other whilst there's a 50, 60-year-old man or, you know, elders sitting in the room. He'll choose his moment. And he's not going to do it because it's too embarrassing. But now he's seen her. She sees him. You're opening up a door. Barakallahu feekum. So don't do that. Are fake teeth or caps allowed due to loss of a tooth? And at the point of death, do they need to be removed? Then yes, it is allowed for a person who has lost their teeth to replace them with other teeth. Uh, so, you know, some of the technology these days allows for that. And even if it was present, even in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, and in later times, you know, there are measures or procedures that can be used to replace teeth so yes it is allowed the question is or would be what about silver teeth or gold teeth then yes for men silver teeth are allowed as for gold teeth then the scholars they differ some of the scholars they say yes yes it is allowed and they there's a hadith of one of the companions who was injured in battle 
and his nose, the whole of his nose was cut off. So the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to, to replace his nose with a nose that was made out of pure gold. So they use that and they say, likewise, if the teeth are broken or injured, it is permissible to replace it with silver or gold teeth. At the point of death, then if it is of value, such as gold and silver, then yes, the scholars, they say that it should be removed because wealth is not to accompany the person to his grave. The wealth of a person does not accompany him to his grave. Rather, if it is gold or silver, then it is removed and it is put into the estate for inheritance. Is dancing haram? You can dance for your husband, no problem, inshallah. It is permissible for a, for a woman to dance for her husband. Dancing for a hobby, I don't, don't know. Yeah, dance in front of your husband for a hobby, no problem. And get some exercise at the same time. But not to the accompaniment of music. Instagram, TikTok, these types of social, social media platforms, then you should stay away from them. I don't say they are haram, but they are of very, very little benefit. Waste of time, tapping and moving your finger across and moving it back and tapping at that one and tapping at that one. Wasting your time. Get up and sort your house out. Get up and sort your clothes out. Get up and read something. Get up and do something. Prepare the next meal. Sort your health out. Do some exercise. Go for a walk. Get some fresh air. Go and visit your mother. Go and visit your sister. Do something for your husband. Do something for your children. All of this wasting time on Instagram and YouTube and you know whatever else of social media of no benefit. Unless there is some religious benefit that you're getting. So you're listening to something, a dars, or you're reading an article written by a Salafi sheikh or a Salafi student of knowledge. Then there is benefit. As for what we see from our brothers and sisters, just wasting their time on these gadgets. You may not regret it now, but a time will come when you're going to wish that you did use your time more wisely. Allahu musta'an. Do you keep family ties with non-Muslims? Yes, you do. What if they are abusive, drunk, does things like rip off your hijab, then stay away, barakallahu feekum. If you fear violence, and they are abusive, and they are drunk, and they might do something, then stay away or go to them when they are sober. And when they agree that they will not abuse you and they will not be violent towards you and they will not touch your garments and they will not touch your person. If they agree and they apologize for doing it in the past, then yes, you can open up the door and visit them. But maybe you should take your brother or take your father or take your son or take your husband so that you feel safe. Otherwise, don't. Barakallahu feekum. Because no one has a right to treat a Muslim in that manner. Relative or non-relative. Non we don't care. No one has a right to treat a Muslim with abuse and get drunk in front of you and pull off your hijab. Stay away from such evildoers, even if they are your family members. How dare they touch a Muslim woman in that fashion and abuse her and try to rip off her hijab. If they rectify and yet they apologize to you and they promise you will not happen again, then say, okay, then... I will start normalizing relations with you. But don't you dare think that you can touch a Muslim woman and get away with it like that just because you are my cousin or you're my relative or whatever. Don't you dare touch me. Even if you're my own blood brother, don't touch me. Don't try to rip off my hijab. Otherwise, between you and me, I'm not going to visit you up until you apologize. And I will make dua for you that Allah guides you because there's some sickness in your heart that would cause you to touch a modest woman in that fashion. Barakallahu feekum. Don't tolerate that. Ayyakumullah. Keeping family ties and boycotting the sinner. Then I mentioned it today. Inshallah, I've mentioned it already. You just go over the dars. That you can, you know, boycott a person and then advise them at the same time. Or keep a distance. So they recognize that you're keeping a distance. And advise them at the same time. And if there's an opportunity whereby you can gather between the two, i.e. that you're keeping your distance but you're advising. So you're not totally boycotting but you're leaving the door open. So they're not your general companionship. They're not your friends on a daily basis. But every so often you pay them a visit. Every so often you phone them, send them articles, WhatsApp articles to them, beneficial things to them, 
audio clips to them because that opens the door of relationship even with your family members. Because some family members are terrible. Allahu musta'an. I know. Terrible in terms of how they behave. That just because they're, they're your relative, they think that they can abuse you because you're a person of sunnah or put their hands upon your person. No, we don't tolerate that. But it doesn't mean that we can't advise them and teach them and uh, remind them constantly. Jazakumullah khairan. Upon that note, let's finish inshallah. Let's empty the prayer area, the musalla, so that uh, the masjid is clear for the men to come and pray. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shahadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk.